Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Hey there. So I'm Jeff Blanchard. I'm one of your elders. Um, we're going to read a little scripture here this morning, so welcome. And we're reading Matthew, let's see, 10, 16 through 23. I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. Be on your guard against men. They will hand you over to local councils and flog you in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses, uh, witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and father and child, children to, will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. I tell you the truth, you will not finish going through the cities of, of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Lord, thank you for this time today to gather together, to be a church body, to hear your word. Please soften our hearts and open us up to what you would have to say. Uh, be with Jordan as he says it to us, because uh, his words flow through you, wrote Lord, and we thank you for that. Uh, thank you for those who are gathered here. Um, bless them, fill them with your joy, with your love, with your peace, with your knowledge and your wisdom uh, as you send us out this week, and have us be a blessing to those around us, Lord. Thank you. In your name, amen.
simum forced out of simum lies. If you're trying to feel the simum force inside, there's a better life. There's a better life. Amen. Well, good morning once again. Welcome to Antelope Springs Church. Thanks for being here this morning, whether you're here in the building or you're on the stream joining us. Good to be together. Together has a lot of different meanings these days. Um, yeah. So, you know, you know how you have a train of thought and then it just leaves the station without you? That's what just happened. I was just like, chugga, 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 goodbye. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, in the chair pocket in front of you, there's some stuff. 
One of those things is called a connection card. That card is for updating your information. It's for sharing your info with us for the first time, if it's your first time here. It's for communicating prayer requests. It's for writing little smiley faces for someone to see later. Maybe don't do that, or, or do it. Just, you know, don't tell them that I told you to do that. Um, yeah, so it is a tool for communication. Let's use it for that. There's also an offering envelope. After our announcements, we will have a time of offering. If you want to use that envelope to prepare for that time, it's there for you to use. We also have online giving, antelopespringschurch.org, and then there is a little give button up at the top in the menu. If you're on your mobile phone, you have to push the little three lines. That's called a hamburger menu, just some you know, inside lingo there for you. You have to tap the hamburger menu, which does not look anything like a hamburger, but, you know, whatever. Um, anyway, this has been a fun thing. All right, let's do the announcements. Didn't work. There we go. Um, buddy Break is going to be on the 24th at 6 p.m. If you don't know what Buddy Break is, it is an opportunity for parents and caregivers of children with special needs to have literally a break. That's why we call it Buddy Break. The buddy part is that the children come here and they get paired up with someone who's called a buddy. They've been trained to um, just come alongside children with special needs. They know how to care for them. And so the kids come here. They have a lot of fun. There's all kinds of cool stations and stuff that they do. Um, and then the parents are able to take a break for a while. So if you are that person or you know someone who is a parent or caregiver of a child with special needs, point them in our direction. We love to use this as a resource for our community. So let's get the community involved and like tell them about it. Because if we're just doing cool stuff over here but we don't tell people about it, then they don't know. So tell people about it. Um, the closed closet is going to be open on the 25th from 9 a.m. to noon. This is also a resource for our community that we should be telling people about because that's why it's there. So um, if you know of people who could use that resource, point them in that direction on that day at that time. Also, if you're looking for a way to get involved, this is always a place where we need more helpers doing all kinds of stuff. You can contact the office to get involved or Shelly Brown, you know, whichever you have contact information for, office at antelopespringschurch.org, in case you didn't know. Um, fellowship night is going to be not very soon, because it's in October, but it's coming up, and we got to mark our calendar, so this is going to be a fun night of fellowship. Surprise, surprise. Um, there's going to be all kinds of cool stuff. I'm not even going to share all of the details yet, because you can find out, but it's going to be really cool. Um, there is going to be a charge for entry because we're going to use that money to support a ministry opportunity. But yeah, this is something that God put on the heart of a couple of people who go to this church. This is one of those times where God is moving and it doesn't always take people who are like on staff or like look like they're super close to Jesus. Like everybody can hear from God and do cool things and everybody can be close to Jesus. There's no like special rank or power that makes that like important or necessary. So basically, God put something on someone's heart, and it's happening. And that's a cool thing that we should celebrate. So mark your calendar so you can go celebrate that. And that's all we've got for today. So let's go ahead and just turn our hearts towards God. Let's quiet ourselves and uh, pray for this offering this morning. Lord Jesus, thank you for this time, for this place, for these people, Lord. Um, I just ask this morning that as we, as we bring this offering before you, an offering of our resources, of our time, an offering of our worship, Lord, would this offering be pleasing to you? Would it be an offering that you just um, look down upon and smile? Would it, would it be your children humbly coming before you and giving you a, a small gift? We can never repay the things that you've done for us, Lord. You're so great and big, and you've blessed us so abundantly. But this morning, Lord, we want to step out in obedience. We want to honor you. We want to worship you with our whole lives. And so I just ask that you would help us to do that humbly and um, gratefully, Lord. Thank you for this time and for all that you do for us, Jesus. We love you and pray this in your name. Amen. <laughs> While my morning sun, the darkness fills the night, cannot hide the light. Whom shall I fear? You crush the enemy underneath my feet. You are my soul and shield. 
troubles linger still Whom should I fear? Whom should I fear? I know who goes before me I know who stands behind The God of angel armies Is always by my side
Amen. Yeah. I want to thank Aaron and Bradley and Mark, the, the Antelope Springs boys. The ASC trio. The ASC trio. AS trio? Don't ever say that again. For you, Bradley, I will do that. Unless I forget. Good morning, everyone. How are we doing? Buenos dias. Uh, si. Espanol. <laughs> Hola, me llamo es Jordan. Would it, would it be Jordan? Yeah? I don't know. I took high school Spanish. That was, that was in high school. <laughs> All those years ago. <laughs> Everyone's just like, All those years ago, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Jordan, if we've never met before, and uh, we like to have fun here because uh, we, we're a family, and it's, it's great. Uh, I'm the interim pastor while our pastoral search committee continues the search for the next lead pastor of Antelope Springs. And uh, I want to make sure before we jump into things that we take a moment, because I'm the kind of person, my personality, I have to fight against this because uh, I tend to get focused on the thing that I'm doing, and then once that's done, I just kind of push it to the side and I go, okay, that thing's done, now the next thing, and, and move on. And, and whether it's tasks on a list or even just moments in life, uh, like you know, special days, the day happens and then it moves and, and we forget about it. And I, I was reminded this morning uh, during our prayer time with the elders uh, before Sunday, we always gather as elders to pray, and I was reminded that uh, a special thing happened last Sunday. We, we had a, a moment of God being at work among us. Um, and I don't want to just, okay, next thing, and move on from that without recognizing it. I had in my mind an idea of how that would work, the, the time of prayer together. And we had elders and chaplains out uh, on the sides of the room, and, and we were available for prayer. And I saw some people utilizing that, but I saw God working 
in, in, in other ways because everyone who was seated, you guys just on your own, clustered together and started sharing prayer concerns and praying for each other uh, as that was happening. Now, I wasn't expecting that to happen, but it did. And, and that's what, you know, we, we, we don't, we have our own ideas of how things are going to go, and we, we try to, to, to build space for God to be at work. And sometimes God works in different ways than we're expecting, and that is beautiful. Amen? And so I just wanted to, to comment on the beauty of that moment. Uh, I, I was very touched last, week, last Sunday uh, just seeing everyone coming together, uh, a few people raising their hands and, and elders and, and chaplains going over to, to pray with them, some people getting up, uh, but many people just, just gathering together to pray. And, and what a holy moment. What a special time. Amen? Amen. So I just, I just wanted to, to, to not simply move on from that, but, but to, to have some time of, of reflection and, and praising God that, that He works uh, in ways that I'm not expecting. And I love that. All the time. And all the time, God is good. Oh, oh, let's do this. He is risen. Ha! <laughs> Just the random times throughout the year that, that we're doing that. Oh, that's fun. Okay, so now, hard turn. Let's just move on to the next thing. No. Um, <laughs> but we are continuing in our series through Acts. We've been going through Acts since January. Uh, this morning, we're going to cover the last little bit of chapter 21, starting at verse 37. And then we're going to get almost, we're almost all the way through chapter 22. Uh, there's just going to be one verse that we're going to save for next week. Uh, so if you want to get your thumb in your Bible opened up to that spot, feel free to do that now. But before we actually jump into God's Word, let's talk for a little bit about growth and change, our two favorite subjects, right? We love, yeah, <laughs> we, we love growth and change, right? No, we don't. Because growth and change, uh, you know, we, we build our lives to, to be in a particular way. I like things a certain way, so I build my life to function within that realm. And when God asks for growth and for change in me, then that means those things that I've built up in my life are going to be disturbed a little bit. And I don't like that. And I don't want to, you know, God, God calls me out of my comfort zone a little bit and says, this is, this is a good thing. I have good things planned for you. And, and I just go, no, God, but I like it how it is. Why can't it just stay how it is? But the reality is, God loves us just exactly the way that we are. There's nothing that we need to do to earn our love from God, from Jesus. But Jesus loves us too much to allow us to stay the same. Hallelujah. He wants more from us. He wants us to, to look more like him. He wants us to grow and to change. And so sometimes what that requires in order for us to grow and to change is God's going to call us to do uh, new things, into new patterns of behavior, into new ways of living our life, into new experiences. He's going to tap us on the shoulder and he's going to nudge us and say, hey, go pay for that person's groceries. Go uh, compliment this person. Go and, and do this thing. Be my hands and feet in the world. Sometimes in very small ways, sometimes in very big ways. But he calls us to step outside of our comfort zone into new patterns of living. And that grows us and that changes us. But it requires us to not simply go, no, but God, I like things just the way they are. I don't, I, I've built it up this way and this is my kingdom. Because uh, God says it's not about your kingdom, it's about his kingdom, yeah? And so God calls us to new and amazing things, and, and we can throw up all kinds of excuses. You know, uh, God, I'm not ready for it. Uh, maybe in another month. Uh, maybe if I receive the right training in order to take that step. Because, uh, you know, what if I go in there and I just fail so bad that I actually push people away from you? So God, you know, <laughs> you don't want me to do this right now because I'm not in a spot where I'm ready for it. Here's the thing. When God calls us to new things, new patterns of behavior, new 
uh, new uh, ministry opportunities, whatever it is that God is calling us to. God's not taking a risk. It's not a gamble on his part. God's not saying, okay, could you go ahead and, and, and move in this? Could you go and, and talk to this person? And God's not sitting back and going, oh, I don't know, crossing his fingers, biting his nails, praying to himself. Or anything. God's, it's not a concern. It's not a fear. It's not a hope of, I don't know how this is going to turn out. God knows how it's going to turn out. He knew before he ever asked you to do it. When God calls us to something, it's not because he's, you know, wanting to see if we're ready. It's because he knows we already are ready. Like the teacher who sees the student and, and goes, okay, now you, you've, you've got the beginning stuff. Now you're ready for the intermediate stuff. Yeah, the student might not think they're ready, but they are. And, and the teacher knows if we hang out only in this beginning stuff, then you're never going to grow. And so God calls us to new things, even when we don't feel ready, in order to show us, no, 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 I've already prepared you for this thing. I've already prepared and given you everything that you need for this time. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. So let's pray, and then we'll jump into God's Word together. Father God, in heaven, your name is holy, your character is righteous, you are good, you are love, you are justice. Lord, we want to see your kingdom here on earth, not our own kingdom, not the kingdom of, of uh, other people, of famous people, of rich people, of, uh, uh, of whoever it is. We want to see your kingdom, God. We want to see your will, your desires being done here on earth just as they are in heaven. We ask that these things you call us to, these new uh, ministry opportunities, these, these new patterns of living, God, that each and every day you give us exactly what we need to step out in those ways. God, we ask that you forgive us for our sins just as you ask us to forgive those who have sinned against us. And that as we walk this path that you've placed before us, you would help us to not turn to the right or to the left, but keep us on the straight and narrow. Deliver us from the evil one. Because Jesus, yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. It's because of you that we pray. Amen. So Acts chapter 21 starting in verse 7, says, As the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the commander, May I say something to you? Do you speak Greek? He replied. Aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists out into the desert some time ago? And Paul answered, Well, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no ordinary city. Please let me speak to the people. So let's pause there and kind of get our bearings on the passage, what uh, happened, what we're stepping into. So do we remember last week, Paul's in Jerusalem, and uh, he goes up to the temple, and, 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 and a riot starts, just a mob forms, and, and they start a riot, and they start beating Paul up, uh, trying to kill him. Do we remember that? Do we remember why they were trying to beat him up? Because there were um, some Jews from... Asia Minor, that, that section of Turkey where Ephesus is, uh, and they were visiting the city while Paul was at the temple with Trophimus, and Trophimus was from Ephesus, and so these Jews recognized him as a Gentile from Ephesus, and they assumed because he was with Paul, Paul had brought him into the portion of the temple courts where Gentiles were not allowed. Because there was this rumor going around, all of the Jews in Jerusalem believed these rumors that Paul was going around from city to city and teaching all of the Jews there that, that they didn't need to worry about all this Old Testament garbage. The Old Testament law, the, the ways of living, the, the patterns of living that the Jewish people had been following for hundreds of years, they, they, you know, it, it's worthless. They can just throw it away. We don't need this. It's not what Paul was doing, but, you know... Rumors sometimes have the ability to sound true, even when they're not, right? 
And so these rumors were going around about Paul. They see him with Trophimus. They assume because, you know, if he says get rid of the Old Testament, then maybe he's going to say who cares about where uh, each person is within the temple courts. Let's just bring everyone in everywhere. It doesn't really matter. And so they get very upset with Paul, and they, they form a mob, and they start beating him up, trying to kill him. But then remember, the Roman commander... Uh, Israel is an occupied territory, occupied by the Roman army and the commander of this army in Israel, uh, in Jerusalem. He's told, hey, there's a mob, they're trying to kill someone. He goes, That's, that looks bad if someone you know, dies from a mob on my watch. So he goes and he rescues Paul from that. He has Paul put into chains because he wants to take him into the barracks, the army barracks, in order to uh, interrogate him. Probably, you know, slap him around a little bit and get the truth out of him. Uh, because he's a Roman soldier. He speaks Greek. All of the Jewish people, they're over there speaking Aramaic. He has no idea what's going on. This mob is here, and they're all just shouting a bunch of things, and he's hearing this, and, and possibly some of them had the presence of mind to shout stuff out in Greek, uh, but, but honestly, it's all just confusion. So he has no idea what's going on. The mob is being very loud, and so he says, okay, let's bring him into the barracks and get nice peace and quiet, and, you know, Roman soldiers are, you know, not the friendliest, and so probably he was going to beat Paul up a little bit in order to get the truth out of him. But then all of a sudden... What we see in this passage that, that Luke tells us, all of a sudden, Paul just kind of like stands up and in very, very eloquent Greek, he's, he's just speaking like, like a well-educated man. He, he says, excuse me, my good sir, might I speak with you a moment? And this Roman commander, he's caught very off guard. He goes, wait, what? You speak Greek? What's going on? Because in his mind, the best thing that the uh, explanation he could come up with was uh, a few years ago in Jerusalem, we actually have historical records from Josephus, uh, the, uh, the Jewish historian, uh, tells us there was an Egyptian man who led a revolt in Jerusalem. He was telling all the Jews that if they went over and uh, they could take over the temple and they could force out the Roman occupation at that time uh, because God was going to break down the walls at his command, and it was going to be an amazing thing. Well, the Roman army just kind of mowed them over. It was no big deal to them, uh, and lots of Jewish people died. But the Egyptian guy, the Egyptian Jew who was leading them, he escaped unscathed. So this commander's thinking the best possible explanation as to what's going on here is this Egyptian guy came back into Jerusalem, and he was at the temple trying to gather support for another rebellion, and all the Jews there are going, wait a second, our brothers died because of you, so they're angry with him, and that's why the mob started, and everything like that. Great guess, but completely wrong, because that Paul's not Egyptian. He says, aren't you the Egyptian? Paul says, absolutely not, my good sir. Speaking, you know, he's being very eloquent. He says, no, I am from Tarsus and Cilicia. It's north of Israel. Egypt is south. That's directions. Uh, and he says, no, I am from Tarsus and Cilicia, a very noble city. I, I have a, a good birthright and citizenship in this wonderful city. Please, sir, if I have your permission, may I speak to the crowd? And I think that's kind of insane of Paul. Because he's basically asking, hey, you know, you remember all these people who just like three seconds ago were trying to kill me? Can I talk with them? What kind of question is that? But he had so uh, uh, shaken the commander, he, he's just like, what is this guy? What, how is he speaking this eloquent Greek? And he goes, yeah, sure. What, why not? Why not? Okay, speak to them. Sure. So continuing on, uh, verse 40, it says, having received the commander's permission... Paul stood on the steps and motioned to the crowd. When they were all silent, he said to them in Aramaic, Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. When they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. And then Paul said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. Under Gamaliel, I was thoroughly taught, uh, trained in the law of our fathers and was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison, as also the high priest and all the council can testify. I even obtained letters from them 
to their brothers in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. So notice there, Paul, so when he's talking with the commander, he's speaking very eloquent Greek. He is talking respectfully. He's making a big deal out of being born in Tarsus uh, and, and all that stuff. Then when he's speaking to the crowd, notice uh, he's not speaking in Greek. He's talking to them in Aramaic. In, the, the, in their common language. And when he says, yeah, I was born in Tarsus, he quickly moves from that. That's like a throwaway thought. Yeah, I was born in Tarsus, but I was raised in Jerusalem. I was raised right, I was brought up right here. I am a good Jewish boy. I know the law. I was trained by Gamaliel. Do we remember Gamaliel? Acts chapter 5, he's the one, uh, all the, the, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders, they're all talking about what do we do with Peter and John and all these people who are following this Jesus guy. Gamaliel's the one who stood up and said, brothers, if this whole Jesus sect, if these people who are following Jesus, if this is not from God, then it's just going to fade away. But if it is from God, then we're going to find ourselves fighting against God. So the best thing for us to do is to sit back and see what happens. That was uh, Gamaliel who said that. He was a very well-respected member of the leaders in Jerusalem. He, he was a, a really uh, important Pharisee in the time. And this is the guy who trained Paul in the Old Testament law, who trained Paul into how to be a good Pharisee, a good Jew, uh, and, and obey God and live for him. And Paul says, look, I, I was trained by Gamaliel. I was as zealous for God as any of you are today. I was so zealous that I even persecuted these people who say they're following Jesus. I hunted them down. I held the coats of those who were killing uh, Stephen, Jesus' servant. I was, I was trying to mess up as many of these people as I could. And, and, and don't take my word for it, he says. The witnesses to what I'm saying are Gamaliel himself, all of the leaders in Jerusalem, all of the Sanhedrin, everyone, they can testify to it. Even the high priest at the time, he wrote letters for me to go to Damascus asking the people in the synagogue there, hey, is it okay if Paul finds the people who are following Jesus and brings them back to Jerusalem to put them on trial to be killed? There is evidence for how zealous Paul was to live for God and to persecute these people who followed this Jesus guy. Paul is establishing his connection with the crowd and saying, look, I was exactly like all of you, even more so. You think you love God. I loved him even more, and I was doing whatever I could, and then I went to Damascus. Verse 6, about noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He went by Saul back then, remember? It's Saul, Paul, same guy. Cool. Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told all that you uh, have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. So there we get the same story that Luke told in Acts chapter 9, except this time, instead of hearing it from Luke, the narrator's perspective, we're, we're hearing it from Paul's own mouth, from his perspective. And so he tells us it was about noon, uh, which means, you know, the, the part of the day where the sun was shining brightest, and yet a, a, a light shone brighter than that, a light from heaven that was brighter than the sun at the brightest part of the day shone for him, and, and, and it blinded him, it was so bright. And this was a unique experience for Paul, unique even amongst the people who were traveling with him, because they saw the light, but they weren't blinded. And they heard the voice, but they didn't understand what was being said. This was something that was specifically for Paul, Jesus revealing himself to Paul, saying, look, why are you persecuting me? I'm persecuting these people who are, who are following you. What? I'm not persecuting you. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. By persecuting them, you're persecuting me. What are you doing? Paul, Paul gives the explanation, look, he's talking to this crowd, and he's saying, look, I was so 
passionately devoted to God that I was hunting down these followers of Jesus, and then Jesus found me. You want to know why my life went a complete 180 and turned the complete opposite direction to, to cause me from going and hunting the people who were following Jesus to becoming one of his followers? Because Jesus showed up, and he worked powerfully in my life. He blinded me on the road, and I had to be led into the city to be shown what God wanted me to do. How Jesus works in our lives, what he does uh, in our lives, that is the best story that we can tell. We are his witnesses. We testify to the things that we can see and hear and touch that Jesus has done in our lives. It's the best explanation for why we do what we do, yeah? Amen. So Paul continues on. In verse 12, he says, A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and he said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. And then Ananias said, the God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized and wash your sins away, calling on his name. So here, Paul gives another witness, Ananias. He's the one in Damascus who uh, did exactly what Paul said. He, he went to Paul and, and prayed over him. And uh, then in Acts, in chapter 9, we see uh, there's something like scales fell from Paul's eyes and he was able to see again. So Paul is calling Ananias as a, a witness. They can go to Damascus and they can talk to him and he will tell them what happened. And notice, Paul does not call Ananias a devout follower of Jesus. He calls him a devout follower of God, well-respected by all the Jews living in Damascus someone who is well-trained in uh, God's Word, in the Old Testament law, in how to be a good Jew. Uh, this, these are the credentials that he's providing for Ananias, so that if they go and talk with him, they know he is a credible source. He's a credible witness. And uh, so Paul uh, talks about how, first, he, he established his credentials as he is a good Jewish person, right? And then he said, here's how Jesus came into my life. And now he's saying, here is why I was going to all these cities and talking to people, because Jesus had set me to be his witness to all people. Everywhere I went, I was supposed to tell them about him, tell them about what happened in my life. He's giving the reason. He wasn't going to teach people to turn away from God or turn away from his law uh, and not obey God. He was going to be Jesus' witness in all these places. And so he says he, he was baptized, and then he lived for Jesus every day since. And we've seen that in Acts, right? So continuing on, he uh, finishes up his speech to the crowd in uh, verse 17. He says, when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance, and I saw the Lord speaking Quick, he said to me, leave Jerusalem immediately because they will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied, these men know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. And then the Lord said to me, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. So this is an interesting bit because in chapter 9, what Luke tells us after uh, Paul was in Damascus, he tells us he went back to uh, Jerusalem at that time, and all of the believers were, they were kind of scared of him because they knew that he had been hunting down Christians, uh, and, and they didn't know, quite know what to do with the whole story that, oh no, I believe in Jesus now. But Barnabas, remember, vouched for him, and he was able to stay in Jerusalem for a little while until suddenly, Luke says, he, he just left Jerusalem and went back to uh, Tarsus, his hometown. But here we get this story that wasn't in chapter 9 uh, of while Paul was in Jerusalem, Jesus appeared to him another time. And Jesus is the one who told him, hey, get out of here. 
you can't be here. And why did he need to leave? Because the Jews at that time in Jerusalem would not accept his testimony about Jesus. It was not time for them to hear it. And he goes, but Jesus, all of these people, they know how much I was persecuting the Christians, how much I was hunting them down, how, how zealous I was against you. Now they're going to see how much I am for you. And, and won't that be a good thing for them to see? Isn't that something that they need to be told? And Jesus says, no, no, no. I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. Paul is telling this to the crowd of Jews that are in front of them, in front of him. And he's telling them, essentially, by, by saying that, he's saying, look, you guys weren't ready for this. This story that I just told you, you weren't ready to hear it yet. And you know what? The Gentiles were. <sighs> these, these unclean Gentiles who aren't allowed into the inner courts of the temple, who, who you look down upon so much, they were ready, and you weren't. They were prepared for it, and you weren't. They were better than you were. So that you get this information secondhand right now. <laughs> you thought they were mad at him before. Verse 22, the crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live. And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the commander ordered Paul to be taken into the barracks, and he directed that he be flogged and questioned in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. And as they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? And when the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and he reported it. Uh, what are we going to do, he asked. This man is a Roman citizen. And the commander went to Paul and he asked, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Well, yes, I am, he answered. And then the commander said, well, I had to pay a big price for my citizenship, but I was born a citizen, Paul replied. Ooh. Those who were about to question him withdrew immediately. And the commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. So this is just crazy. Because Paul had been, he'd been so diplomatic, he'd been so eloquent, he had been speaking so nicely up to this point. He talked nice with the commander, he talked nice with the crowd, and then at the very end, he just like digs the knife in and twists, and they're like, Whoa! and the riot starts up all over again. And I feel kind of bad for this uh, commander and, and his troops, because again, they don't speak Aramaic. They have no idea what's going on. All they know is this guy spoke beautiful Greek, asked permission to speak to the crowd, and then when he started speaking, these people who just seconds ago were trying to kill him, they just go quiet. And he's speaking gibberish, they can't understand what he's saying, and, and everyone's just listening, and, and they're paying attention, and they're so quiet. And these guards had to have been looking like, well, what is he saying that's got their attention so much? And then all of, he goes on for quite a while, he's talking, right? And then all of a sudden, he says something, and a crowd just up, run, and they're shouting, and they don't understand what he's saying. And so they, they finally go, okay, enough is enough. We're getting him inside. So they pick him up, and they throw him in the barracks. And the commander is going, okay, you know what? We're going we're gonna to whip him. We're going to inflict some pain, and then we're going to get the truth out of him. And so the commander leaves his men uh, to do that because, you know, he's a commander. Delegate, that's good, sure. And so he leaves the room, and the centurion is, like, binding Paul. And I can just imagine, he's, you know, Paul's, like, stretched out, and he's putting the, the chains and binds on him. And Paul just cool as a cat, completely nonchalant, just like, hey, quick question. Um, if a man's uh, a, a Roman citizen and uh, he's not been convicted of any crime, is it legal for you to beat him up? Because I, you're you're in the army, you would probably know the law better than I would, right? He's just completely just digging this, and the the guy I can just imagine he's you know working on whatever the shackles and everything, and he's just like, what? Runs out of the room, goes to the commander, says, uh, boss, I, I, we got to talk about this. He's saying he's a Roman citizen. What? You're kidding. No. Runs out there because it is, in fact, illegal. At that time, it was illegal to uh, beat up a Roman citizen. It also was illegal to put them in chains and lead them away in chains in front of a crowd, you know, like they just did. So this is like turning into a big mess 
for them. And so he runs in, and he confirms with Paul, are you a Roman citizen? He says, yes, I am. Ha ha. Uh, probably he would have had like a, a little, uh, it wouldn't have been a piece of paper, but there were little boxes that they could carry around that showed, yes, I am a Roman citizen. So he, yeah, an iPad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> probably pulled that out and said, yep, here it is. And then the commander goes, well, you know, when I was getting my citizenship, I had to pay a pretty hefty bribe to get that. How much did, how did you get the money to be able to pay for yours? And Paul goes, well, I was born a citizen, which means Paul's father had to have been a Roman citizen, and which also means that his claim to citizenship was greater than the commander's claim to citizenship, which means he was even in, in more trouble than before. And so everyone just like backs up from him. They're like, oh, okay, we're not touching him. And we're left going, wait a second, what happened in this passage? When we started this passage, Paul was this poor, defenseless, cowering victim. And then in about two verses, he turned to the person who's in charge of everything. He's, uh, he's, he's like, you know what? I know what I'm doing, and here's what's going to happen. You're going to let me speak to the crowd. Cool. Crowd, shut up. You're going to listen to me. And, and then he goes, you know what? You want something to be angry about toward me? Here, I'll give you something to be angry about. And then he's like, joke's on you. You think I'm afraid to be in custody? I'm a Roman citizen. I know my rights. This is an amazing... And so all this stuff is happening, and it's like Paul is just in complete control. And go, what happened there? And the only thing that I can think of that, that, that makes sense to me for him to have gone from this cowering victim into knowing exactly what was going on is that in his mind, something just all of a sudden fell into place, and he realized, wait a second... I have everything I need for this. I, I, I know how to talk to this commander guy. I, I was educated, and, and I know how to speak eloquent, and I'm from uh, Tarsus. I have the background and the experience. He will listen to me. I know how to speak to this crowd. I've been going around and talking to many crowds for a while, but also uh, I was, I was uh, taught by Gamaliel. I was raised as a good, I know the Old Testament. I know how to follow Jesus, how to follow God. I can speak to these people and tell them what happened. And you know what? I know exactly what's going to go on. I know exactly what they need to hear. He goes, all that time, way back when I was in Jerusalem and I was praying and Jesus showed up and he said, you need to get out of here. I didn't understand why I needed to leave. All of a sudden he goes, I thought it was, it, it, it seemed like it was because they weren't ready to hear it yet, but now I realize I wasn't ready to tell it. I needed to go through all the experiences of my missionary journeys uh, in order to come to this place where right now I have everything I need to do this thing that God has called me to. So in that confidence, in that boldness, Paul just steps up and he says, yep, I'm here. And I'm going to say what God has for me to say. And I think God works similarly in our lives too, right? I don't know when I've been asked to do that. No, not, not necessarily the same exact situation, but in similar ways where God is at work in our lives and he uses even small events to prepare us for the things that he's calling us to. He grows us. He changes us more and more into his image so that when people look at us, they more and more see Jesus. And so when we get to those moments where God is calling us to something new and calling us to growth, we find that we already have everything we need. God has already prepared us for that. It's not a matter of, God, I don't know if I'm ready. I'm, I'm not sure. I want. But we can step out boldly in confidence knowing that what God has called us to, he has prepared us for. And so when we come to those moments, I don't know what those moments are. I would imagine some of us in here this morning have something that God has been placing on our heart, have some way that God has been nudging us and saying, hey, you know, it's time, to, it's time for a little change. It's time for a little growth. Here you go. I don't know what that is, but, but if that's you this morning, you definitely know what that is. And I've got to say, sometimes those things are really big. Sometimes they're really small. But I'll tell you what, no matter what, even if it's the small little steps, those are the steps that prepare us for the greater thing that God has for us further down the line. And it's important, even in those little things, to be obedient. 
And to trust that if God is calling us to it, if, if we see God at work in it and we understand his will and he is desiring for us to move in this particular way, we should be able to step out in confidence knowing that either uh, this is a moment that he is preparing us for something greater or this is something that he has already prepared us for and we are ready for it finally. Or a combination of the two. But we should not shrink back and go, you know what, God, I like my life exactly the way it is. I've built up my kingdom. This is how I like things. I don't want to change. Instead, we should step out in faith and boldness and confidence, knowing that God's not taking a gamble on us. This isn't a risk. But these things he has called us to, this is what he has prepared us for. Amen? Amen. Let's pray and then worship our God through song one more time. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the ways that you've been at work in our lives. Some of us in very dramatic ways, like Paul on the road to Damascus, where you showed up, showed up and, and you shone your light in a very dark spot in our lives. Others of us uh, where you came and you brought healing. Others of us, you, you, Jesus, you rescued us from our own selves. Lord, whatever it is, however you have been at work in our lives, I know that you have been, been at work in every single one of our lives and that we have that testimony. We have that witness to be able to share with others, this is why I follow that Jesus guy. This is why I do the things I do. And when he calls me, when, when my Savior, when my Lord calls me to new patterns of behavior, to new ways of living, to new ministry opportunities, to new things, I know that he has prepared me for them. And that he has his intended results in mind. And his word will not come back empty. We love you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for the confidence you give us as you are at work in our lives. And Lord, it's because of you that we pray. Amen. <laughs>
tried to hear him, he hears your voice. He will wipe away your tears. Rejoice in the midst of suffering. He will help you see. Rejoice. Come and lift your hands and raise your voice. He is worthy. God bless you guys. Have a great week.